pre-calc 0.5 outline. This one, today we're going to split into two days. First day is just the system of linear equations. Tomorrow we'll talk about the inequalities, shading. So today, first off is graphing, to solve a system by graphing. Now, we got to start off this solve by graphing stuff with the idea that graphs are not very accurate when you and I make them. Sometimes when we make these, our tick marks are not very uniform. Our lines are not very straight. And so that will throw off our results. But it is a very valid way of approximating solutions. And I think that is a very good but often forgotten skill that we all should have. If I needed to quickly estimate about how many deaths are in this room, and I already can see it, people are counting them. One, two, three, four, five. That's not estimating. That's the exact, that's finding how many deaths. There are 32 in this room, if you don't include the front, my desk and the front desk over there. But there are 32. But if I was saying, hey, let's approximate about how many deaths or how many about how many people can fit in this room, and you'd be like, 30. It looks like because it looks like you've got pretty uniform rows and columns. And so you got five in a row, and there's a bunch of columns. So therefore, 30. That'd be a good approximation. Because in a lot of instances, approximations are just fine. My cabin's on a lake. How big is your lake? Well, your lake's round, it's oblong, it's got shoreline that goes in and out, there might be an island. So, when I looked it up on Google, it said it's a 40 acre lake. Well, how the heck did they get 40 acres? Did someone actually go around the whole entire perimeter of it all and figured out all the inlets and everything else? No. You overlay a grid on it and say, okay, every box is either full or half full maybe. And so where the shore kind of comes into the box and out of the box or whatever how it is, it comes for half a box or half of a square unit. Stuff like that. It's a skill, guys, that you guys started developing back in elementary school. But by the time we got to middle school, we didn't care about approximations. We wanted right and wrong answers. So graphing to me is that approximation. It doesn't always work. How do I know if I'm right? I'm going to check my answer. And if I'm wrong, it's okay. I just say, hey, I know I'm wrong doesn't mean to redo the whole thing. But you should be in the about the approximately right place. So there are two different types of lines, I guess we'll say, not types of lines, forms of lines that we'll deal with in this class. The first one is highlighted here. 3x minus 2y is equal to negative 6, and x plus y equals negative 2. Both of these, I hope you guys could recognize is in what form? What form is this? So yes, standard form is the form that we have here. Standard form helps us find two very important parts or points on our line. Notice that I already set up parentheses with zeros and blanks. That's because when I see standard form, I like to use the cover-up method. I go to the eye doctor, use cover-up. Because what the eye doctor does is it tells you to cover up your left eye and then read the chart. And then cover up your right and so forth. So, why do I call it cover-up? Well, because if I put 0 in for x, 3 times 0 is, so I cover it up. What's negative 2y equal negative 6? I could solve for y. Divide both sides by negative 2, so y is equal to 3. I can do the same thing for y. Put a 0 in for y. So 3x equals negative 6, negative 2. I'm going to change colors here. Do the same thing for x uh, plus y. So y is equal to? y is equal to? So both of them are equal to negative 2. That's the easy part about having x plus 
y equals a number. Now all I have to do is graph it. Okay, I'm going to do the bottom one because I have red already. So negative 2 and negative 2. And there's my line. That's the bottom line. Top one I'll change back to blue. But what are these points? What do these points represent? What is 0, 3, 0, negative 2? Negative 2, 0. Those are all special points. They are the x and y. Intercepts. Here's a really cool thing about x and y intercepts. The further they are apart from each other, I think the more accurate your line will be. Because if you think about it, if I had to connect <coughs> these two points right here on the top corner, those two points, any variation, right? Look at that. I'm it looks like I'm a little higher up on the left and on the right. Maybe I'm going straight through the center. That is going to have implications at the far ends, right? It's not going to be the true line. But then I take maybe that same exact line. If I had points further apart and I did that, I could end, well, this is that's a bad line. But it'd be less of a variation the further they are apart from each other, if I can hit both of those lines. I don't know if you guys can visualize that or not, but the closer the points are, the more variation and error you could have. So that's kind of cool. So if I had to solve this system, you would say there's one solution, that one solution is where? negative 2 or negative 2 comma 0. First of all, it's the point they have in common. So if I had to say by some degree of certainty what the solution is to that system by graphing, how certain are you that you have the answer? I think 100% certain that you've got the answer. Which kind of then throws what everything out that whole long speech I gave in the front half of saying that Sometimes graphing is just not very accurate. There are examples where you can be absolutely for sure, I know I got this. Of course, what else do we have here is I could change this to say purple, and I'll say, hey, can you graph that line? 2 thirds x plus 1. Every one of us should be able to. That form is slope intercept form, which I'm going to start where? at 1, and I'm going to go up 2 and over 3, which is there. And if I went up 2 again, up 2, 1, 2, 3, there. I don't know. Some of us, I mean, if you look at my tick marks, look at the tick mark between 3 and 4. Uh, up here. That tick mark right here. That's pretty big compared to this one. It's not very accurate. It's like things are beginning a little bit off in different places at different times. Maybe over time they kind of make up for themselves, but lines I can't necessarily trust that they are going to always be nice. So each one of these has its benefits, its fallbacks as well. Okay, and again, if I wanted to know if negative 2, 0 was correct, I would take that point and place it where? Into both equations. It needs to work in both. If it, you put it into the first equation and it doesn't work, do I even need to check it in the second? No, it just doesn't work. If it works in the first equation, do I still need to check it in the second? Yes, because you very well could have stumbled across the point on one line, but not the other. Okay? 
So be very careful on that. The next thing we're going to talk about then is the substitution method. These are online. I can't make it any larger, although I'll lose, lose the stuff on here. But basically, the substitution method says that if I take one of those equations and I solve it for a variable, I'm allowed to take the expression of what that variable equals and substitute it into the other equation, which would result in one equation, one unknown. I can solve it, find what the variable is worth, plug it back in to solve for that variable that's still unknown. Now, let's back up here. I said put it into the equation. It's because if I'm solving a two unknown system, I need to have two equations. If there are three unknowns, I need to have three equations. If there are ten unknowns, I need to have ten equations. Now, there are other ways to handle systems, especially if they start to get pretty large. It's called matrices. It's called Kramer determinants. All of those things. You may have talked about that last year or the year before that. Okay. Yes. So our system here is 2x plus 3y equals 9, and 5x minus y equals 14. When I look at a system like this, I'm always looking for what variable is easiest to solve for. In this case, I think the y is the second equation. Why? Because it's the closest one to be by itself. And if I think of those other two numbers in that equation, the 5 and the 14, are they divisible by negative 1? And the answer is, yeah. They both would have, negative 1 would go in there pretty nicely. Just change the signs. Because if I look at 2, let's look at the 2x there. If I say, hey, I want to solve for x, I would have to divide everything by 2. But 3 divided by 2 is not nice. 9 divided by 2 is not nice. Oh, okay, we're not doing that then. If I don't have to, you can. It just makes things a little bit more difficult. I could try this y here, but I have to divide everything by 3. Oh, 9, divis 9 is divisible by 3. That's fine. That's good. But 2 is not divisible by 3 nicely. Same thing with the 5. To get rid of the 5, I have to divide by 5, and 1 and 14 are both not divisible by 5 nicely. So therefore, I would definitely go with the y. And I think the easiest way to do this would just be add y to both sides and subtract 14. So y is equal to 5x minus 14. I now have y equals. I did step one. Step two says take this expression and place it in for y in the other equation. Now when you do this, you better make sure that you are using parentheses. So we get 2x plus 3 times something equals 9. And what is that something? 5x minus 14. Plus. Now, what do I have to do with that 3? I need to distribute. 3 times 5? 15x. 3 times negative 14? Gathering like terms? 17x minus 42 equals 9, or 17x equals 51. Divide by 17, x is 3. Now here's the cool thing about substitution. As part of my substitution steps, I created in a variable in terms of another. That's right here in the corner. That's the first thing we did. So that means if I know x, I will know y pretty easily. That's the nice thing about substitution. So y is equal to 
5 times 3 minus 14, or 15 minus 14, which is 1. So y is equal to 1. Are you done? It says substitute and step 3 into the other variable and solve for it. You gotta check your coordinates, but maybe before even that. Again, that's checking your coordinates. I need to write the point because this, the solution to a system is a point of intersection. So I need to list it as a point. And of course, you should check those in both of your equations. Now, this is where it's different than um, graphing. Substitution method, if you do it correctly, will always tell you the solution, if there is one. They'll also tell you if there's not one. Questions? The elimination method. The elimination method is actually the method that I guess I would say I prefer. Um, but because it, because it also works, and the fact that I like to add instead of substituting it when I can. Um, Step one says multiply one or both equations by a number to result in two equations that contain opposite terms. In other words, you're multiplying one or both equations so that you get the coefficient on your variable, x or y in most cases, to be the same, but one of them to be positive and then one to be negative, so that when I add them together, they disappear. Bless you. So make sure that you're using multiplication to one or both because you can sometimes get away with one or both or nothing at all. Now there is a way to do this by getting the same coefficient. You could have a 2x and a 2x right away. And then therefore I could subtract them to make zero. The reason I shy away from that is because students forget that when you subtract one part of an equation from another, you have to subtract all corresponding parts from each other. Then people forget that when you subtract a negative, you are actually adding. So be extremely careful on that. Then, what happens when you add them together is you result in one equation, one unknown. You can solve for it and then substitute it back in to solve for the uh, re remaining unknown. Obviously, ready this point. Now, I'm going to use elimination, but I see some things right off the bat that I don't like. I don't like decimals. And I wouldn't necessarily like fractions in my problems either. Now, this fraction is not necessarily bad, but since it's a decimal, the easiest way to get rid of any decimal with one place in it is to multiply both sides of the equation by something that moves a decimal. What would that be? 10. If you multiply by 10, it moves it to the right one. If you multiply by 10 squared or 100, it moves it two places to the right. If you divide by 10, it moves it one place to the left. So I want to, in both of these problems, Move the decimal one place to the right. I am going to multiply both by 10. Sorry, there is a 10 in front of the screen there. You guys can't see it up there in the video and on here. It's all good. But don't forget that when you have something up front of that equation, you are multiplying to all three pieces. It means all the way across. So what's 10 times 1.5? It's 15x. 10 times 2, 20y. 10 times 200, it's 200. What's 10 times 2.5? 25. 10 times 5, negative 5, <coughs> negative 50. And 10 times negative 25, negative 250. Now we have a system with whole numbers. I like this. And now the question you'll ask yourself is, so how can I get rid of one of those variables? Which one do you guys want to get rid of? X or Y? X. Y. 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 Y.
Uh, well, guess what? Everybody would be correct. I just shouted out which one they want to get rid of. Because it doesn't matter. I personally would try to get rid of the Ys. But why? One of them is already. And the other one is. Yes, I already have a plus and a minus. That way I don't need to distribute any kind of negatives through. Now, the question then you have to ask yourself is, self, what number does 20 and 50 both go into? They both don't go into 50. It's a 100. So, 20 times what is 100? 5. So I'm going to multiply the first equation by a 5. 50 times what is 100? 2. 5 times 15? 75. 5 times 20? We engineered that to happen. And 5 times 200? Is 1,000. 2 times 25? 2 times negative 50. Again, we try to make that happen. And 2 times negative 250. And now I just need to 100 plus a negative 100. Gone. What's 75 plus 50? 125x equals 500. Divide by 125. x equals 4. Now here's the limitation. I think that went pretty fast. Not too bad. Most of the time you don't have to get rid of decimal first just to get rid of a variable. Um, the limitation here is the fact that I don't have an equation of y equals now. I have to use one of the original equations. Now you can use the 1.5, the 2.5, or I could use that next layer and say 15x or the 25x. Which one do you guys want to use? You want to use the 1.5 or the 2.5. It doesn't really matter. I personally, well, first of all, we're multiplying a half by a 4, which would get rid of the halves, right? But instead of taking that chance, I personally would rather use one of the ones that has no decimals in it. So I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to place it in the 15x plus 20y. So 15 times 4 plus 20y is equal to 5, or not 500, but 200. What's 15 times 4? 4? If I get rid of the 60 to the other side, it's 20y equals... Divided by seven. Whoops. Twenty. Why seven? So the point is four seven. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve a system of three equations, three unknowns. The coolest thing about it is the exact same thing. It's just that you have to do this process more than once. On a 3x3 three three system, I need to get rid of a variable, that's round one, which if I get rid of a variable, I end up having two variables, and then I do it again to get down to one variable. It's fun. You guys have done this before. Now, when I look at this problem, there is a variable that I'd say, hey, it'd probably be easier to get rid of first. Which one is easier to get rid of? The third equation. The third you can't just get rid of the third equation. I have to get rid of a, a variable. I think Z would probably be the easiest one. Take a look at equation one and two. What can I do? Can I just add them together and they're gone? Okay, let's do that. If I add these two together, that means I have x plus 2x, which is 3x. Negative 2y plus 3y, which is oh y. Oh, z plus a negative z, gone. And 7 plus 15? 22. Now, when you made the choice to get rid of the z's the first time, 
you now set your course of action for the next step. Your next step is to get rid of z again using two different equations. You're not allowed to use 1 and 2 anymore. You can use 2 and 3, or you can use 1 and 3. I personally would choose 1 and 3 as well, because one of them is positive, and the other one is negative. And the first equation is really acceptable to anything I want to multiply it to. So if I want to multiply it by, in this case, 5, I can. So I'm going to put together this one, and I'm going to multiply the top equation by 5. So I'm going to do that first. 5 times x, 5x. 5 times negative 2y, negative 10y. 5 times z, 5z. And don't forget to go all the way, 5 times 15. 75. Notice that I don't have to multiply that third equation by anything, so I'm just going to bring it along for the ride. Bless you. And I'm going to add them together. What happens to these? They cancel. We engineered that to happen. Ooh, a side effect. The y's also canceled. But 5 plus 4 is 9x equals, can you solve for x? Now, um, this will not always happen, as in both of those two, or two variables cancel out. More than likely, there should have been y's. You would take this equation. You would put it together with this one to get rid of the y's or the x's then. But since we got down to just x, I was able to solve for x. And then, now, I can do my back walking because guess what? If I plug in x here, can I solve for y? And once I know x and y, can I go back to the original equations and plug them in to solve for z? Yeah. So 3 times 8 plus y equals 22. 24 plus y equals 22. Subtract 24. y is equal to negative 2. Which equation do you guys want to put x and y into? Top one? Okay. So 8 minus 2 times negative 2 plus z is equal to 15, yeah? Uh, 8, negative, negative, so positive 4 plus z equals 15. 8 plus 4 is? So 12 plus z equals 15. z equals 3. So the point is 8, negative 2. Three and check it if you need to. The reason I'm showing you this is the fact that there are some things about graphs that you guys should know. If you have two lines that intersect, there is a solution because those lines intersect. Those lines have to have different slopes. We call this consistent and independent. It's consistent because it's consistently coming up with an answer. And there's only one of them, so if you're going to be only one, you're going to be pretty independent, yeah? Now, if there's infinite many solutions, the graphs are the same line because they have the same slope and the same intercept. Why intercept? This is consistent because it's consistently coming up with answers, but it's dependent because there's lots of them. And to be inconsistent means you're not coming up with a solution. And the way that happens, the lines are parallel. They're parallel because they have the same slope but different y-intercepts. Those are your three different choices for systems. 
So, the homework is on page P22, 5, 11, 17, 25, and 33. 5, solve by graphing. 11, substitution. 17, elimination. 25 is a 3 by 3, and 33, you need to solve it and tell me what kind of system it is. The directions are all on the problems. I'm just telling you up front, you only have one of each. Have a great day.